getting acquainted with Peter. Where there is Christ, there is hope. While there's life, there is hope. That ancient Roman saying is still quoted today and like most adages, it has an element of truth but no guarantee of certainty. It is not the fact of life that determines hope but the faith of life. A Christian believer has a, quote, living hope, 1 Peter 1 and 3. Because his faith and hope are in God, this living hope is the major theme of Peter's first letter. He is saying to all believers, be hopeful. And before we study the details of this le le first letter of Peter, let's get acquainted with the man who wrote it the people to whom he sent it, and the particular situation that prompted him to write it. The writer, chapter 1, verse 1, he identified himself as Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And some liberals have questioned whether a common fisherman could have penned this letter, especially since Peter and John were both called unlearned and ignorant men in Acts 4 and verse 13. However, this phrase only means laymen without formal schooling, and that is they were not professional religious leaders. We must never underestimate the training that Peter had for three years with the Lord Jesus, nor should we minimize the work of the Holy Spirit in his life. Peter is a perfect illustration of the truth express, expressed in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 through 31 he's given his given name was simon but jesus changed it to peter which means a stone the aramaic equivalent of peter is cephas so peter was a man with three names nearly 50 times in the new testament he is called simon and often he is called simon peter Perhaps the two names suggest a Christian's two natures, natures, the old nature Simon that is prone to fail and a new nature Peter that can give victory. As Simon, he was only another human piece of clay, but Jesus Christ made him a rock, made a rock out of him. Peter and Paul were the two leading apostles in the early church. Paul was assigned especially to minister to the Gentiles and Peter to the Jews. The Lord had commanded Peter to strengthen his brethren and to tend to the flock. Also see 1 Peter 5 verses 1 through 4 and the writing of this letter was a part of that ministry. Peter told his readers that this was a letter of encouragement and personal witness. Some writings are manufactured out of books the way freshman students write term papers but this letter grew out of a life lived to the glory of God. A number of events in Peter's life were are woven into the fabric of this letter, and this letter is also associated with Silas. See 1 Peter 5 and verse 12. He was one of the chief men in the early church and a prophet, and this means that he communicated God's message to the congreg congregation as he was directed by the Holy Spirit. The apostles and prophets worked together to lay the foundation of the church and once that foundation was laid they passed off the scene. There are no apostles and prophets in the New Testament since in the church today. It is interesting that Silas was associated with Peter's ministry because originally he went with Paul as a replacement for Barnabas. Peter also mentioned John Mark, whose failure on the mission field helped to cause the rupture between Paul and Barnabas. Peter had led Mark to faith in Christ and certainly would maintain a concern for him. No doubt one of the early assemblies met in John Mark's home in Jerusalem. And in the end, Paul forgave and accepted Mark as a valued helper in the work. Peter indicated that he wrote this letter at Babylon, 
where there was an assembly of believers, there is no evidence either from church history or tradition that Peter ministered in ancient Babylon, which at the time did have a large community of Jews. There was another town called Babylon in Egypt, but we have no proof that Peter ever visited it. Babylon is probably another name for the city of Rome. And we do have reason to believe that Peter did minister in Rome and was probably martyred there. Rome is called Babylon in Revelations chapter 17, verse 8 and 18, verse 10. It was not unusual for the persecuted believers during those days to write or speak in code. And in saying this, however, we must not assign more to Peter than is due him. He did not found the church in Rome nor serve as its first bishop. It was Paul's policy not to minister where any other apostle had gone. So Paul would not have ministered in Rome had Peter arrived there first. Peter probably arrived in Rome after Paul was released from his first imprisonment about the year AD 62. First Peter was written about the year 63. Paul was martyred about 64. And perhaps that same year or shortly after, Peter laid down his life for Christ. Chapter 1, verse 1, Peter called them strangers, which means resident aliens or sojourners. They are called strangers and pilgrims in 1 Peter 2 and 11. These people were citizens of heaven through faith in Christ, and therefore not a permanent residence, not permanent residence on earth. Like Abraham, they had their eyes of faith centered on the future city of God. See Hebrews 11 and 8. They were in the world, but not of the world. Because Christians are strangers in the world, they are considered to be strange in the eyes of the world. Christians have standards and values different from those of the world, and this gives opportunity both for witness and for warfare. We will discover in this first book of Peter that some of the readers were experiencing suffering because of their different lifestyle and these believers were a scattered people as well as a strange people the word translated scattered dysphoria was a technical term of the jews who lived outside of palestine it is used this way in john 7 verse 35 and james 1 1 however Peter's use of this word does not imply that he was writing only to Jewish Christians because some statements in his letter suggested that some of his readers were converted out of Gentile paganism. There was undoubtedly a mixture of both Jews and Gentiles in the churches that received this letter, and we will notice a number of Old Testament references and allusions in these chapters. These Christians were scattered in five different parts of the Roman Empire, all of them in northern Asia Minor, which would be modern Turkey. The Holy Spirit did not permit Paul to minister in Bithynia in Acts 16 and 7, so he did not begin this work. There were Jews at Pentecost from Pontus to Cappadocia, and perhaps they carried the gospel to their neighboring proverb province. Possibly Jewish believers who had been under Peter's ministry and other places had migrated to towns in these provinces. People were on the move in those days and dedicated believers shared the word wherever they went. The important thing for us to know about these scattered strangers is that they were going through a time of suffering. They were going through a time of persecution. At least 15 times in this letter, Peter referred to suffering, and he used eight different Greek words to do so. And some of these Christians were suffering because they were living godly lives and doing what was good and right. Others were suffering reproach for the name of Christ and being railed at by unsaved people. Peter wrote to encourage them to be good witnesses to their persecutors, and to remember that their suffering would lead to glory.
but Peter had another purpose in mind. He knew that a fiery trial, quote, fiery trial, was about to begin. Official persecution from the Roman Empire, see in 1 Peter 4 and 12, when the church began in Jerusalem, it was looked on as a, as a sect of the traditional Jewish faith. The first Christians were Jews, and they met in the temple precincts. The Roman government took no official action against the Christians since the Jewish religion was accepted and it was approved. But when it became clear that Christians, Christianity was not a sect of Judaism, Rome had, a, had to take official steps. So several events occurred that helped to precipitate this fiery trial. To begin with, Paul had defended the Christian faith before the official court in Rome. He had been released, but then was arrested again. And this second defense failed, and he was martyred. And then second, the deranged emperor Nero blamed the fire of Rome on the Christians, using them as a, sca a scapegoat. Peter was probably in Rome about that time, and he was slain by Nero, who had also killed Paul. Nero's persecution of Christians was local at first, but it probably spread. At any rate, Peter wanted to prepare the churches. We must not get the idea that all Christians in every part of the empire were going through the same trials to the same degree at the same time. It varied from place to place. Though suffering and opposition were very general, Nero introduced official persecution of the church. And other emperors followed his example in later years. Peter's letter must have been a tremendous help to Christians who suffered during the reigns of Trajan, 98 through 117, and Hadrian, 117 through 138, and Diocletian, 284 through 305. Christians in the world today may yet learn the value of Peter's letter when their own fiery trials of persecution begin. While I personally believe that the church will not go through the tribulation, I do believe that these latter days will bring much suffering and persecution to the people of God. It is possible that Silas was the bearer of this letter to the believers in the provinces and also the secretary who wrote the epistle. In chapter 5, verse 12, 1 Peter is a letter of encouragement we have noted that the theme of suffering runs throughout the letter, but so also does the theme of glory. One of the encouragements that Peter gives suffering saints is the assurance that their suffering will one day be transformed into glory. This is possible only because the Savior suffered for us and then entered into his glory. The sufferings of Christ are mentioned often in this letter. Peter is preeminently the apostle of hope, as Paul is the apostle of faith and John the apostle of love. As believers, we have a living hope because we trust a living Christ. This hope enables us to keep our minds under control and hope to the end when Jesus shall return. We must not be ashamed of our hope, but be ready to explain and defend it. Like Sarah, Christian wives can hope in God, 1 Peter 3 and 5. Since suffering brings glory and because Jesus is coming again, we can indeed be hopeful. But suffering does not automatically bring glory to God and blessing to God's people. Some believers have fainted and fallen in times of trial and have brought shame to the name of Christ. It is only when we depend on the grace of God that we can glorify God in times of suffering. Peter also emphasized God's grace in this letter. He said, I have written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. The word grace is used in every chapter of 1 Peter. Grace is God's generous favor, 
undeserving to undeserving sinners and needy saints and when we depend on god's grace we can endure suffering we can turn trials into triumphs it is a grace alone that saves us god's grace can give us strength in times of trial grace enables us to serve god in spite of difficulties whatever begins with god's grace will also lead to glory and as we study first peter we will see how the three themes of suffering grace and glory unite to form an encouraging message for believers experiencing times of trial and persecution these themes are summarized in first peter 5 and 10 a verse we would do well to memorize. True Christian hope is more than hope, hope so. It is confident assurance of future glory and blessing. An Old Testament believer called God, quote, the hope of Israel. See Jeremiah 14, verse 8. A New Testament believer affirms that Jesus Christ is his hope. 1 Timothy 1 and 1. The unsaved sinner is without hope, and if he dies without Christ, he will be hopeless forever. The Italian poet Dante, in his Divine Comedy, put this inscription over the world of the dead. Quote, Abandon all hope, you who enter here. This confident hope gives us the encouragement and the enablement we need for daily living. It does not put us in a rocking chair where we complacently await the return of Jesus Christ. No, instead it puts us in the marketplace. It puts us on the battlefield where we keep on going when the burdens are heavy and the battles are hard. Hope is not a sedative. It is a shot of adrenaline, a blood transfusion. Like an anchor, our hope in Christ stabilizes us in the storms of life. See Hebrews 6, 18 through 19. But unlike an anchor, our hope moves us forward. It does not hold us back. It is not difficult to follow Peter's train of thought. Everything begins with salvation, our personal relationship to God through Jesus Christ. If we know Christ as Savior, then we have hope. If we have hope, then we can walk in holiness and in harmony. There should be no problem submitting to those around us in society. The home and the church family. Salvation and submission are preparation for suffering. If we focus on Christ, we can overcome and God will transform suffering into glory. Amen.